Hello and welcome to my workshop on crafting compelling conflict in works of fiction. I hope you find my workshop enjoyable and useful for writing your own stories and novels. My primary focus is on the conflict of novels. However, to an extent, the guidelines are the same for short stories and plays. Now, before I go any further, I just want to put conflict into perspective in terms of how important it is to storytelling, be it a short story or a novel or a play. Uh, and to do that, I need to go back to basics for a minute. Let me start with the definition of a novel. A novel is a fictitious written narrative of considerable length and complexity, which is typically presented in a sequential organisation of scenes. A short story is a story with a fully developed theme, but significantly shorter and less elaborate than a novel. Characters, plot and setting are the three support legs of your, sto your stories are built on. A novel needs all three legs to be strong and steady, otherwise your novel won't stand. Stories must take place somewhere, involve at least one character and have a plot, that is, cause and effect. Now, uh, I'll just repeat that. Characters, plot and setting are the three support legs your stories are built on. Now, to create plot, we need conflict. So conflict equals plot. Plot is cause and effect, action, reaction. Conflict, as defined by the Macquarie's Dictionary, is a battle or struggle, especially a prolonged one. Conflict is fuel for our stories. It's the beating heart of any story. Conflict creates drama, theatre, spectacle. Story with a beginning, a middle and an ending. Conflict makes things happen. It keeps the plot churning and characters excited. It makes events unfold and holds readers glued to the page. Harmony, on the other hand, initiates stasis, inertia, nothing much happening. With conflict, you have cause and effect, which keeps the story rolling along. While harmony might be lovely and the story might look promising, it'll quickly stall. It has nowhere to go. There's no drama, nothing to hook the reader. Without conflict, your story won't stand. Writing compelling conflict is a multi-layered task that is more, an more than achievable once you know how. Why is it that we humans are so drawn to conflict, to drama? So much of what makes us human and how we live our lives is tied in with our emotions. We as humans are, emotions, are creatures of emotion and in my very humble opinion writers tend to be highly emotional, which is a good thing I might add, otherwise I doubt we'd write. You, my fellow writer, like me, are drawn to conflict as a moth is to flame, which again is a good thing because it's through conflict we learn. Calm waters never did a skillful sailor make. Through conflict, being inner or outer, big or small, we learn about ourselves and how better to navigate conflict. First-hand experience of conflict is, I think, the best way. However, we can't always do that. Most of us would be utterly shattered or dead, especially if we were dealing with conflict in war-torn countries or other perilous situations. Fortunately, we also learn about the machinations of conflict through reading short stories and novels. And it's what readers, who are also emotional, crave as well. Readers don't necessarily want to live through real-life dramas, but they do love the vicarious experience of reading about the dramatic lives of fictional characters who are believable. Without emotion in stories, a character's personal journey is pointless. Stakes cease to exist and the plot becomes a dry riverbed of meaningless events that no reader will take the time to read. Readers pick up a book to have an emotional experience. They read to connect with characters who provide entertainment and whose trials may add meaning to their own lives. Now, I just want to add here that sometimes some people, usually non-readers or people who only read non-fiction, will say to me they don't like reading fiction because it's not the truth, it's made up. And I say to these very ignorant people, fiction is a lie through which we tell the truth, and that's Albert Camus. So although our stories might be fictional, often the themes are true, and an author's fictional work is often drawn from real-life events. Anyway, I digress. In the over 5,000 words short story Flexion from the anthology Like a House on Fire by Australian author Kate Kennedy, uh, published in 2012, a woman witnesses what she believes will be the death of her husband Frank Slovak as he is crushed under their farm tractor. He survives, a harsh man who is unable to show gratitude towards the kindness of others, unable to ask for help, unable to show weakness or to tolerate perceived weakness. 
His aggrieved wife, believing he will die from the accident, begins to plan a future without him. And she's quite happy about that. But then her husband Frank, who's now crippled, unexpectedly pulls through and she is left to care for him. So there's a great deal of conflict and emotional clout in this story. The stakes are high. The wife despises her husband and takes an almost cruel satisfaction in becoming the dominant one in the relationship until a moment of genuine warmth and shared understanding happens at the end of the story. The language the author uses in this story is emotionally ladle, which adds to the sense of conflict and which in turn elicits an emotional response in the reader. Now I'm just going to read from some of this uh, short story, Frexion, and take note of the language and the adjectives that were used. Frank's wife feels sympathetic eyes behind her as she wheels a trolley around the supermarket. Women on the verge of saying something, but thinking better of it, anxious not to be seen as nosy. After almost 20 years of near invisibility, the accident gives her an odd kind of glamour. There are casseroles wrapped in foil left at the front door, anonymous gifts of jam and cake and of soap. It's like flowers at a funeral, she thinks, a gracious gesture that comes too late. Sympathy delivered once you're already dead and buried. And all for Frank, she thinks with bitterness. Frank who'd rather cut off his own hand than be holding to anyone who's never put himself out for any of these people, never done them a single spontaneous good turn. Frank who liked his privacy to the point of glowering, hostile secrecy. The year she'd lost the baby, he'd driven her home from the hospital, the big hospital, half an hour away, so that not even the local nurses would know and told her, looking straight ahead through the windscreen, we're putting this behind us. No jars of jam then, no lavender soap, not a word spoken or confided until she'd felt she might go mad with the denial of it. They'd put it behind them all right. They harnessed themselves to it and dragged it like a black dead weight at their backs. They became its beast of burden, and not a neighbour in sight then to drop by with a crumb of pity or a listening ear. Frank had decided that nobody was to know. Okay. Uh, another excellent example of a short story with compelling conflict and emotional clout is the short story Brokeback Mountain by American writer Annie Prue, published in 1999. At 10,500 words, uh, it's a very long short story and it was made into a film starring Heath Ledger and Jake Glynnell and directed by Anne Lee in 2002. I'm just going to give you a summary of the story so you can get an idea of the enormity of the conflict in this story. Um, it's a fantastic story. It's a really beautiful love story and a tragic love story. Um, in 1963, Rodeo dropped cowboy Jack Twist and ranch hand Ennis, Ennis Delmar are hired by rancher Joe Aguirre as sheep herders in Wyoming. One night on Brokeback Mountain, Jack makes a drunken pass at Ennis that is eventually reciprocated. Though Ennis marries his longtime sweetheart and Jack marries a female fellow Rodeo rider, the two men keep up their tortured and sporadic love affair over the course of 20 years. When Jack is bludgeoned to death with the tire lever because of his homosexual relationship with Enos. 1963 was a very repressive time for gay men, especially I would imagine the circles Jack and Enos worked and socialised in. Again, it's a tragic love story with a great deal of conflict. It's an extremely powerful story, um, and as you can see, with a lot of conflict. So, to everyone out there, it's important to remember that you're writing fiction which is emotional and not corporate report, which is logical, rational, reasonable, reasonable and boring, okay? Your novel should be full of excitement and passion and highs and lows, joys, fears and expectation, wrong terms, disagreements and emotional entanglements that attract the reader's attention, pulling them closer and closer to the essence of the story. Fiction, with its inherent conflict, makes for gripping reading. Readers want to know what's going to happen, whether characters will work out their difference or come to blows. If your story is good enough, readers will need to know how story conflicts are resolved. Set characters against one another, even good friends and loved ones. Set a character against himself, struggling with competing beliefs or needs. Characters should rub one another the wrong way and push each other's buttons and it's conflict that leads to this behaviour. 
and as with any cycle, emotional button pushing should lead to increased conflict. Readers feel conflict is tension. When you write conflict well, readers feel it. They may feel uncomfortable or antsy or feel fearful, but they're turning the pages and that's what counts. Sometimes a good guide as to whether or not we're successfully evoking the right amount of conflict when we're writing is how it stirs up our own emotions. To quote Robert Frost, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. No surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. The conflict in stories can be on an epic scale. Stories about the Second World War, such as the novel All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doyle, or on a much smaller, more intimate scale, such as, um, and yet equally as powerful, for example, in Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, or The Twin by Herbram Bucker. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this novel. Um, this novel follows the flight of Helmer, who resides on a Dutch farm with his father. It is a Dutch novel, translated in English. Um, his twin brother, Hank, died accidentally some 30 years earlier, and his mother some years later. The relationship between father and son is strained, as Helmer always thought that his father preferred his twin brother and wanted him to take over the farm. Helmer never married and was tied down to the farm all those years, needing to milk the dairy cows twice a day, every day, for decades on end. His elderly father is now dying. So it's hardly a story of earth-shattering significance. The Twin is a very quiet novel about the very ordinary people living and working on a very ordinary dairy farm in Holland. But the story really packs a punch. The story of the fractious relationship between father and son is very powerful and I think it's something many readers can relate to. And I'm just going to read you the opening page um, where I think the description and the dialogue, you get a sense that there is conflict. This is not a happy relationship. I've put father upstairs. I had to park him on a chair first to take the better part. He sat there like a calf that's just a couple of minutes old before it's been licked clean with a directionless wobbly head and eyes that drift over things. I ripped off the blankets, sheets and undersheet, let the mattress and bedboards against the wall and unscrewed the sides of the bed. I tried to breathe through my mouth as much as possible. I'd already cleared out the upstairs room, my room. What are you doing? He asked. You're moving, I said. I want to stay here. No. I let him keep the bed. One half of it has been cold for more than 10 years now, but the unslept side is still crowded, crowned with a pillow. I screwed the bed back together in the upstairs room facing the window. I put the legs up on blocks and remade it with clean sheets and two clean pillowcases. After that, I carried Father upstairs. When I picked him up off the chair, he fixed his eyes on mine and kept them there until I was laying him in bed and our faces were almost touching. I can walk, he said, only then. No, you can't. Through the window, he saw things he hadn't expected to see. Up high, he said. Yes, that's so you can look out and see something other than just sky. Despite the new room and the clean sheets and pillowcases, it smelt musty. He smelt musty and mouldy. I opened one of the two windows and used the hook to set it ajar. Outside it was quiet. A fresh chill was in the air and there were only a few crumpled leaves left on the topmost branches of the crooked ash in the front garden. Off in the distance I saw three cyclists riding along the dike. If I had stepped aside, he would have seen three cyclists as well. I stayed put. Get the doctor. Father said, no, I replied, turning to walk out of the room. Okay. So in this novel, the twin, the plot is largely character driven. Uh, and then there are your plot driven novels, such as crime novels, uh, which is focused on the actual happenings and the external changes of the story. However, there are crime novels that can buy, combine both. For example, The Scholar by West Australian writer Dervlin McTiernan, that was published last year. And that was a nice balance of character and, and plot, character and plot. So character was driving the story, but it was also very much plot driven. How to generate conflict through characterization? 
When writing your story, try and avoid characters getting on with one another. Avoid perfect characters, unless you plan on murdering them later on in your story. Because it's from imperfect characters that we get conflict, drama, story. For example, in the short story, Napoli Abu by Irish author Noala O'Connor, published in 2017 anthology, Joy Rider Jupiter, the main character, Tara, is provocative whereas her travelling partner, Beatrice, is pacifying. And this is, she's an interesting character, uh, Tara. So I'll just read the opening to you and you can make up your own mind out there. Fuck knows how I ended up agreeing to go to Naples with a spinster. Not even my spinster, but a stray of my sisters, offered up to me as a solution to my singlehood, a partner in the pathetic. Beatrice is on her own too, Clotter said. She's into the kind of stuff you like. You know, art, uh, old ruins, all that. She'd love to go to Italy. I'm grand, going on my own, I said. Ah, go on. Poor Patrice is lonely. She could do with a break. So we sat side by side, two unbridled yokes, scrambling for things to say, though the aeroplane hadn't yet reached 10,000 feet. Patrice sneezed crazily as the plane climbed. Summer cold, I asked, though I couldn't care less. Allergies. There's nothing I hate more than the LG Brigade with their I can't eat this and I can't tolerate that and does this have gluten? Snot spewed hankies and garlands around them. The only thing worse is a vegan. Jesus wept. I was surely headed into the longest week of my life. Okay, so that's a really strong opening for a short story and you can see the conflict like Tara, she is an obnoxious person. So from her, we're getting story, we're getting plot. Uh, because her business, that character, she is not about getting on with people. Okay? If she got on with people and if she was lovely and gorgeous, you wouldn't have story. Okay? Now, returning to what I said earlier about avoiding perfect characters, sometimes in fiction they do work well. For example, in Pride and Prejudice, uh, where you've got the gorgeous Elizabeth Bennet who Mr. Darcy falls in love with. Elizabeth, while she does have her faults, she's proud and also has her prejudice, likewise Mr. Darcy, but these traits alone aren't enough to sustain a novel. Therefore, uh, conflict is created by her mother, Mrs. Bennet, and she's your archetypal 19th century airhead, who jeopardises Elizabeth's chances of marriage and upward mobility through her insufferable behaviour and inability to rein in her two youngest daughters unacceptable behaviour, that is Lydia and Kitty, who are your archetypal 19th century slack moles. Further conflict is also created by Elizabeth's pride and Mr Darcy's prejudice. There is also further conflict with minor characters. So that Mrs Bennet in Pride and Prejudice is a very important character and more because she, she is obnoxious. And so that generates story. It's why Mr Darcy is very hesitant about marrying uh, Elizabeth because of her family. Importantly, make the characters suffer. They're on a journey and they'll be rewarded at the end. Heap onto your main characters as much adversity as you think they can take. Have contrasting characters with contrasting emotion. Do try emotions or having every character with the same emotional makeup though. When you're writing or when you're creating conflict, it's advisable to avoid melodrama or writing purple prose, which is writing which draws attention to itself, or writing where it's obvious the writer is blatantly telling the reader what to feel and not allowing the reader to make up their own mind. However, sometimes uh, what critics call purple prose or ornate prose is used to good effect in fiction, such as in the novels by Charles Dickens and The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, some of which I'll be reading out to you a little bit later on where the reader is being obviously manipulated but, no, but may not be aware of it at first. I certainly wasn't in the goldfinch. I was too enthralled with the story. And to be fair to Dickens, his unique style was perfectly acceptable in the 1800s when his novels addresses, address societal issues. All writers manipulate their readers. The trick is not to be too overly obvious. But then again, this depends on what kind of book you're writing. So while it's advisable to avoid melodrama, it's certainly not essential. It's up to you whether or not you have ornate prose in your story. As I like to say, no one knows the play like the player. So it's a bit of a balance between melodrama and sending your readers to sleep. Okay, so if you can kind of reach that happy medium, but if you go for melodrama, over the top writing, I think as long as it works. Uh, writing a story is like 
is a craft, like building a chair is a craft, and every good chair has four legs, a seat and a back. Every good drama has desire, conflict, passion, tension, obstacles and reversals. And while the ultimate test for a chair is, can you sit in it? The ultimate test for a drama is, can you sit through it? Hence why you need compelling conflict to keep readers turning the pages of, your manu of their manuscript, of your manuscript. Compelling conflict can be built. Step one, choosing the right conflict or problem for your short story or novel. Often what happens with writers is that an idea springs to mind. We might be sitting at the traffic lights or having a shower or washing dishes. Usually something tedious which allows our mind to drift and our imagination to flourish. Okay, now ideas when they land into a writer's fertile imagination are typically cause for rejoicing. Yes, I've got a brilliant idea. It'll make a great story. I love it. You scribble the idea down somewhere on the back of a docker, the foggy shower door, a notepad you keep in your car expressly for this purpose. You add bits and pieces to the scribble. Now, before you get overly serious about your scribbling, I would advise that you ask yourself the all-important question, does it have conflict? What's the problem? What's the problem for my main character? Is it important enough? Can it generate enough plot or story? Will it engage readers? Is my short story, is my story a short story or a novel? Typically, a short story deals with one incident or problem and has a limited number of characters. A novel deals with one main problem or plot with several secondary problems or subplots which support the main plot, main story or plot. Remember, plot comes from character. The two are interchangeable, plot and character, character and plot. Critically, without interesting characters, your plot will suffer. Okay? So you need interesting characters and, and you need conflict that is significant. Okay? It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be exploding cars or exploding buildings, but it needs to be of some kind of consequence. Sometimes when we first start work on a new story or novel, there can be a sense of nothing's happening. Or by chapter two or three, we're running out of plot. We're unable to generate more story. And one reason be, can be because we set up a promising situation without anything of consequence happening, happening, without conflict. For example, prior to the coronavirus pandemic, the cruise ships sailing around the world were of little consequence or interest to most people. Despite having fantastic setting, you know, they're out in the ocean, promising characters and situation. However, once something of significance happened, that is, the passengers on those cruise ships became infected with coronavirus, the cruise ships became massively important and interesting, especially when there was secrecy, mismanagement, and the virus wasn't contained fast enough or effectively enough. There was conflict, there was life and death drama on the ships. Then there was a hostility directed at the ships by the countries whose waters they were in. So there was conflict, cause and effect. How did all of this affect the passengers, the crew? How did it affect them on an individual level? How did it affect the countries who were forced into dealing with infected passengers and crews? Okay, so that's something to look out for in your own work. Like you can have a really promising situation, you know, but make sure that within that situation, something is actually happening. Okay, you've got some conflict. Um, how the writer can learn to write about the emotional lives of characters in works of fiction. There are a number of ways. A, from your own personal experience. Remembering how we ourselves feel and behave when we have conflict in our own lives. Be it in a conflict or being in conflict with other people or finding themselves in a distressing situation. So in a conflict or out of conflict. With inner conflict, do we think obsessively over the problem and become vague, distracted? Are we unable to sleep at night? Have headaches because we're overthinking, worrying? Do we fidget, self-medicate with pills and alcohol or overeat, neglect other people or work commitments? Do we raise our voice or lower our voice? How do we behave when we find ourselves in a distressing situation, such as in a bushfire or flood? How do we react? Do we act? Do we lose rational thought, regret things we say or do? Or do we become more self-destructive or rally? Or do we become focused and save the day? Another way of learning how to craft a conflict is from books. Study your favourite novels to see how emotion is conveyed through description, action, dialogue, characterization and setting or repeat that through description, action, dialogue and setting. Use your, these novels as blueprints for your own work. 
Uh, the third way, or a great way, is through a book called The Emotion Theosaurus, A Writer's Guide to Character Expression by Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi. This edition that I'm holding was the first edition which came out in 2012. The most recent edition is last year, 2019, and its retail price is $41.20, but it includes a lot more. Uh, you can buy it online from most um, bookshops like Book Depository. This is really an excellent book, and it's well worth having if, if you take for your writing. So just an example, if I open it up to agitation, okay, physical signs, a reddening of the face, a sheen of sweat on the cheeks, chin and forehead, okay, so these are things you can use in your own writing and it's just a reminder of when characters are agitated, how they might look outwardly, avoiding eye contact, a wavering voice, internal sensations, excessive saliva, feeling overheated, overheated, lightheadedness, short, fast breath. Okay, so that's the emotion theosaurus. But ultimately, I think the best way is by reading works of fiction and studying how the author elicits an emotion within you, the reader, through description, that is explanation, characterization, setting, action, and dialogue. Okay, for instance, in the prize winning and best selling novel, The Goldfinch, by American author Tana Tarr, uh, she employs emotionally laden language to convey conflict through characterization, description, setting, action, and dialogue. I'm going to read some of the goldfinch out to you now, uh, just so you can see what I mean and how the the description and the dialogue, how it's the adjectives she uses uh, and the emotional, the, emo the emotionally laden. Uh, I'll just give you a brief summary of the goldfinch. It's basically a coming of age tale told by 13-year-old first-person narrator Theo Decker. His single-parent mother was recently killed in a terrorist bomb in New York City. For a short time, Theo is taken care of by a wealthy family, the Barbers, whose son Theo is friends with. Now, at this point, Theo's dad and his girlfriend, Xander, re-emerge in his life and are about to whisk him off to Las Vegas, where he and Xander live. Theo despises his father and doesn't want to leave New York or the Barbers, who he's quite fond of. So take note of the emotionally laden language and how the setting, characterization and dialogue is used to good effect and how it elicits your sympathies for Theo, or it should. Okay. Don't tell me, my dad said when he arrived at the Barbers the next morning to pick me up in the taxi, that you're carrying all that shit on the plane. For I had another suitcase beside the one with the painting, the one I'd originally planned to take. I think you're going to be over your baggage allowance, said Sandra, a bit hysterically. In the poisonous heat of the sidewalk, I could smell her hairspray, even where I was standing. They only let you carry a certain amount. Mrs Barber, who had come down to the curb with me, said smoothly, Oh, he'll be fine with those two. I go over my limit all the time. Yes, but it costs money. Actually, I think you find it's quite reasonable, said Mrs Barber. Though it was early and she was without jewellery or lipstick, somehow, even in her sandals and simple cotton dress, she still managed to give the impression of being immaculately turned out. You might have to pay $20 extra at the counter, but that shouldn't be a problem, should it? She and my dad stared each other down like two cats. Then my father looked away. I was a little ashamed of his sports coat, which made me think of guys pictured in the Daily News under suspicion of racketeering. You should have told me you had two bags, he said sullenly, in the silence that followed her helpful remark. I don't know if all this stuff is going to fit in the trunk. Standing at the curve with the trunk of the cab open, I almost considered leaving the suitcase with Mrs Barber, but phoning later and telling her that it, what it contained. But before I could make up my mind to say anything, the broad back Russian cab driver had taken Xandra's bag from the trunk and hoisted my second suitcase in, which, with some banging and mashing around, he made to fit. See? Not very heavy, he said, slamming the trunk shut, wiping his forehead, soft sides. Okay. Back to the notes. Ways characters experience and increase conflict. Characters experience conflict in a variety of ways. When you write and edit, be sure your characters experience that variety. Make sure every scene has conflict. Make sure that conflict isn't limited to one time. And make sure that conflict levels increase as the story approaches the climax. Make your characters suffer. They're on a journey. They'll be rewarded at the end. Check your manuscript for the following ways to create or increase conflict. 
Any story may not feature each, but every story should include several. Have characters, um, have characters engage others in a verbal fight. Give another character the silent treatment. Spread rumours. Use body language and facial expressions in ways that rile other characters. Enlist the aid of mutual friends or set one friend against another. Betray a confidence. Pick a fight. Fight verbally or physically. Denigrate something, someone, another character loves. Steal or destroy the possessions of others. Ask third parties to intervene, that is the police, family or friends. Tell themselves to not get involved. Turn away from or ignore problems. In dialogue specifically, introduce or increase conflict through miscommunication. When one character ignores another, speaks right over him, or holds the other character in contempt and so gives no attention to his words. By having one character leave the room or hang up the phone, thus incensing the other. By having one character use provocative words and pursue provocative issues that set the other character. By having one character goad another, just because the first character likes to see the reaction. By having one character use sarcasm. By having one character ignore another character's warnings to back off. By having one character refuse to play the games another introduces. To introduce conflict in action. Have one character take something from another. Allow a minor verbal, allow a minor verbal disagreement to escalate to the physical and violent. Include spectators to the conflict so characters can't back down without losing face. Prick a character's ego so they have to defend themselves. Make a character have to defend another character or living being, injured bird or a choice or personal trait. Use body language of one character show contempt for another. Make one character physically challenging, talks loudly, always offers an opposing opinion, always in other people's faces. Introduce your main character to another character but one with opposing viewpoint or different method for approaching problems. Give a character new facts to ponder, facts that add a twist, to introduce conflict through setting. Drop a character into unfamiliar or challenging or hostile setting. Set a character at odds with cultural norms or laws. Include people groups in with incompatible belief structures, politics or social systems. Utilise the setting. Characters don't live in bubbles, they interact with the world around them. This is especially true when emotions come into play. Try and have characters interact more with the setting to convey emotion. A character in the kitchen might sweep a wine glass off the counter in a fit of rage. But in, in an office setting, the same anger may require some control, ranging from a slammed office door to tense posture and fingers pounding the keyboard. Also think about the weather and how it can be utilised to reflect or enhance a character's emotional state. That is a miserable grey rainy day, scorching hot day. Think of it. Right. An excellent example of description of setting used in the opening of a novel as an omen of eminent conflict is from the novel Paul Clifford by Edward Linton, published in 1830, almost 200 years ago. This is, this is melodrama. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets, rattled along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. So again, in a strong adjective, emotionally laden language. Um, and that is classified as purple prose, purple prose melodrama. But I, I really like it. I think it's great. Um, Writer's tip, it isn't enough to show emotion, a writer needs to make the reader feel it. Think about the core visceral sensations you experience when feeling strong emotion and if suitable, utilise them to convey a similar experience to the reader. Uh, use the clothing choices of characters as well as physical characteristics such as scars, tattoos and jewellery. Think about how these things can be employed by a character to convey their emotional state, you know, the pulling or tugging at a gold chain they're wearing, or uh, pulling or tugging at sleeves until they're frayed, uh, turning a gold wedding ring, straightening clothes, retying shoelaces, all these things. Clothing tends to get neglected, and, and clothing's a great way of showing emotion. Um, don't get overly caught up on the eyes to convey emotion. Uh, while eyes are often the first thing we notice in real life, they provide very limited options for description possibilities. Writers do tend uh, 
to rely overly on the eyes, especially if the setting or character's clothing has been neglected. So if you're finding yourself trying to write a lot about a character's eyes, it might be that you haven't read, written enough about the setting. Okay, so try and include the setting, you know, like a ticking clock or a barking dog. That, that increases the tension in a story. That, you know, that focusing too much on the eyes, that's fine in early drafts of your story. Other ways of expressing emotions through movement, action and dialogue and reaction to setting, which includes weather, setting sun, shadows, etc. in subsequent drafts, okay? If a scene is indoors, things like, again, a ticking clock, sound of an alarm or a siren, a song, sound of a dog barking from far away, or maybe some background kind of music. Music can really add to the, the conflict um, or, or that tension. When you're writing a story, have a good idea of the setting in your mind's eye. You don't have to put the entire setting into your story, but you should know your setting and put some relevant details into your story or novel, which will enhance the mood of the story. The writer should know, or you should have a good idea what the weather's doing in a novel. Is it summer, winter, what time of day is it? If, it is, if it's inside, what kind of furniture or fittings are in the house or the building? Okay, what kind of floor, what kind of floor covering? These kind of de details aren't so important in a short story, but in a novel they're important. And while you might not use them to convey conflict, you might want to. Certainly setting is important in framing your story and adding to its sense of realness or its authenticity. However, having said that, there are stories and novels in which there is hardly any description of the setting or what characters are wearing, such as in the romantic novel of Manners, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, which is mostly dialogue and where the reader has to draw their own conclusions as to the setting and what characters are wearing. Importantly, the conflict is conveyed through the dialogue. Pride and Prejudice is a really interesting book to read uh, because it is largely all dialogue. There's almost no description of the setting. There's no description of the clothes people are wearing or of the country, okay, or what season it's set in. Ways writers introduce or raise conflict. Characters are the ones in conflict, but it's the writer who must put them there. Make sure you've introduced conflict in multiple ways and raise the conflict level using a variety of methods. Use, choose emotionally loaded words for dialogue. Put characters into unfamiliar situations, that is, have a high court judge washing dishes at the kitchen sink, or have a housewife claiming Mount Everest, okay? Give your main characters lots of problems and challenges. Heap them on. Don't be shy. Okay. Introduce characters with opposing viewpoints. Force characters to make a stand. Force characters with different outlooks, backgrounds or morals to work together to achieve a shared goal. Raise the stakes for a character. Make characters disagree. Give characters opposing goals. Give characters the same goals but different methods of achieving those goals. Make one character a go-getter who acts before thinking and one a planner who, who thinks before acting. Make characters face their fears. Make them face their fears in the presence of their foes. Make them face their fears in the presence of those who love them. Make characters rely on weaknesses rather than strengths. Don't resolve conflict too soon. Deny a character what he wants and then deny him again and then deny someone else what he wants. Give a character something worth fighting for. Make a character think she's the only one who cares about a particular outcome or issue. Give readers conflict that's satisfied by making your choice of conflict types fit character personalities, yet also surprise the readers and characters with conflict they don't expect. Put obstacles in a character's path. Make them stop to deal with problems on his way to the, romantic, to the main goal. Frustrate characters by making it hard to reach goals or distract them with necessary obligations that slow down their march towards goals. Introduce uncertainty. Is a friend really a friend? Stir a character's emotions. Make her care and then threaten what she cares about. Pile on conflict so your protagonist feels isolated and under attack from both friends and enemies and even from themselves. Now, a quick checklist. Each, make sure each scene contains conflict. Use a variety of conflict types and intensities. Make sure you understand that a single conflict won't be sufficient for a novel. Conflict, make sure that the conflict seems real, that it's authentic. Make sure the conflict escalates as the story approaches crisis point. 
conflict, make sure the conflict arises from different sources, the story world within a character, between characters. Make sure conflict is appropriate for the genre. Make sure the conflict produces reactions. Make sure that multiple characters are involved in multiple conflicts. Make sure you surprise main characters with conflict from trusted allies. Make sure conflict drives character, action and reaction. Make sure conflict isn't so simple that it can be resolved with a conversation. Okay, that is really important. I'll repeat that. Make sure conflict isn't so simple that it can be resolved with a, comp with a conversation. Make sure conflict between characters isn't limited to that between protagonist and antagonist. Make sure conflicts are settled, concluded, and don't merely stop at the story's end. Give conflicts the proper resolution. Be careful to watch what I call the emotional journey or range in a story, that it's not all heightened conflict. It can be too exhausting or distressing for the reader to read page after page of intense conflict. Have an emotional high followed by a low or a more reflective scene so that your manuscript has contrasting emotional experiences that fit within the context of the protagonist's growth. So your story emotionally should go like that. So it's going up the conflict and then the resolution. Okay. Yeah. Now to recap before I finish this workshop, conflict is essential in storytelling. Something of consequence needs to happen for a story to work successfully. You need cause and effect, cause and effect, so cause and effect. So when you're writing your story, think, where's the conflict? Or as I do, where's the problem? What is my problem? Number two, conflict is conveyed through description, setting, action, dialogue, characterization. And remember, the characterization includes physical descriptions such as clothing. Conflict is conveyed through use of emotionally laden language, emotionally laden language. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed the workshop. Bye-bye.